continuing now on Lecture 41, Seeking uh, Part 3, that we notice uh, in uh, number 5. But the far, far greater hope of seekers was that God would find them. You see, we've already noticed two benefits that's built right into seeking evangelism. I've mentioned several times now the number of their sins is one less. And for anybody who knows biblical theology, that means a very, very great deal. It shocked Charles Braden because he hadn't encountered it apparently. But to a person who knew it and believed it, a seeker under conviction, that would be very, very good news for him, though it was far short of the good news of salvation. The other benefit I haven't uh, mentioned directly, but implicitly, and I think you all pick it up. I said to you that as John Gerstner's seeker, I was the best possible farmer. But you see, if I was the best possible farmer, you know I'm going to prosper. And that is one of the things that came along with the seeking evangelism. These people who were seeking, whether they were lawyers or doctors or farmers or housewives or whatever they were, they were the best they possibly could be by their natural powers. And of course, as that's true, they were praised by the community. They, they were inevitably prosperous. One sort of an indication of that is that there was a saying in those days that being the son of a manse, where ministers live, a son in a ministerial family, being the son of a manse was, vote, was worth 100,000 votes. See, what they meant was getting this Puritan training recommended the voter to go for this particular person. You had confidence in somebody who was trained that way. Well, it's not just the children of the manse, but the children of the parish who believed Puritan Christianity, and even when they thought they weren't converted, were diligent in whatever they did. If they went into the magistracy, when they actually became a candidate for civil office, it was worth many, many votes for them to have been known as the son of a Puritan pastor or a person who sought salvation for a long time in one of the Puritan congregations. They prospered, in other words. Seekers invariably prospered in this world, even if they were lost in the less. But they're the two things. They prospered in this world, and their condemnation in the next world would have been far less. But the main thing, of course, which was driving them to seek was not this world's prosperity or the amelioration of the next world's condemnation, but the actual salvation of Jesus Christ. Now that's what we're talking about here in five. The far, far greater hope of seekers was that God would find them. God would call them. They had great hope of that because faith, if it comes, comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing, and these people were going to hear every time there was an opportunity. You wouldn't have evangelistic services. They didn't attend not only that they would be regular in their own congregation, but if George Whitfield were preaching nearby or Gilbert Tennant came up from Jersey, these people would trudge through snow and go to all sorts of trouble to hear that preacher proclaim the word. They knew that Jesus Christ said to them, Seek salvation, because many will strive to enter the kingdom who will not be able. As far as in them was, they were going to make every endeavor because they knew if they were ever to be saved, it almost certainly would come in the process of seeking. No merit in that process, no deserving, no ingratiating of deity, but nevertheless, Usually when God saved, it was in a person's seeking Him. Never if he fancied he was earning his salvation, but he was seeking as a destitute sinner. That was the most likely way to save. There are three times I have found in the manuscripts of Edwards, for example, where he almost says, if you seek this way, 
you will find. Almost says it. One time I was checking one of the written sermons, published sermons of Edwards, where it actually says that Edwards declared, if you would seek in this matter, you would find the Lord. And I checked the manuscript on that. Edwards hadn't said that. I don't remember exactly now what it was, but I think it was that he said, you will almost certainly, very probably, something like that. But a Puritan divine wouldn't usually do that. Richard Baxter, in his exuberance for this particular doctrine, did actually take that position. And he wrote in a straightforward fashion, he was a Puritan, English Puritan of the preceding century, 17th century, Edwards of the 18th century, Richard Baxter did actually write to his people, if you will do everything in your natural power, in your unconverted power, your actual ability to avoid vice and to avoid lying and to avoid theft and to cultivate charity and such things as that, God will convert you. He actually took that position, but he went too far in that as far as the general Puritan consensus was concerned, and in my opinion, as far as the Bible is concerned. But the point is that it illustrates the tendency of the Puritans was to see the Bible as indicating that there was an extremely high likelihood of a person being saved if he did seek and an even greater likelihood of his never being saved if he never sought at all. Number six, many of these seekers were found by God. This must puzzle you, of course. People are found by God today. People do celebrate their salvation. I hear about it often, and I rejoice with people and so on. What about it? They don't talk about seeking. They won't say to you, I sought God for 20 years. But it may not be quite as different as you think it is. On the surface, it sounds like an entirely different evangelistic atmosphere. Here you go to an evangelistic service and you're saved. Maybe the first time you ever heard the gospel, you believed it, and so on. As I say, you almost never hear anybody who had gone through the kind of discipline that the Puritan pastors put seekers through who have found and tell you the story of their long search. Some do and some don't, but if you actually quiz them, you might see the basic rudiments of the seeking evangelism. But you see, many of those, of course, who claim this are Arminians, so they think it's always in their power at any particular moment. You see, the seeking evangelism is saying, doing everything in your natural power, which means you can't believe. That is not in your natural power. That's only in your supernatural power, your regenerative power, and so on. But since most of our evangelism today is Arminian and is saying, do what's in your natural power, and including in that the notion that they have the power to come savingly to Jesus Christ, you can see why they wouldn't entertain an idea of seeking because it's an alien thought, but at the same time, there may be more similarity there than you know. But I'm just observing on that simple observation of number six. Many of these seekers were found by God. Today we don't talk about it that way, but I have to add the somber note that many who think they are found by God have no basis for so concluding. And I have to say this, you must get this point uh, here. Look, suppose a, person, suppose a person is invited to Christ on the basis of his own power to come to Christ. He's heard an Arminian evangelist. Instead of John Gerstner, the seeker whom I've just been describing, suppose I'm John Gerstner, the unconverted person, who is hearing the evangelism from the lips 
of an Arminian preacher. He is telling me, Gerstner, you are lost, and unless you repent and believe, you will be damned, and so on. But the Lord Jesus died for you. He loves you, Gerstner. He's begging you to come. He's standing at the door and knocking. You turn that door, you open that door, and he'll come in and sup with you forever. It's quite in your power, Gerstner. Nothing keeps you out of the kingdom except John Gerstner. And if you really desire Jesus Christ, come to him. He's waiting for you. He'll receive you with outstretched arms. Those arms which were stretched out on the cross are stretched out for you, John Gerstner. Come, and you will be received by Jesus Christ, you see. And I come on that basis. Let's suppose I come on that basis. What has that been? Has that been an act of faith? Now, mind you, I say, invited to Christ on the basis of my own power. Is that real faith? My own power is only sin. All I can do is works of the flesh. All you're appealing to me to do is exert my fleshly power. So I come down the aisle. I come running. I sign my name. I join the church. I receive baptism. I do it all. And I say, hallelujah, I have been saved. And it's all a lie. I don't even know what salvation means. It's been a work of the flesh. You understand what I'm saying? If I really responded that way, now I got a tiger by the tail here, you see. I don't mean to suggest that everybody who responds to an Arminian invitation actually does respond as an act of the flesh in a spurious, non-saving faith gesture. I guess I better tell you my own story on this to make clear what I mean. I'll finish my sentence, as it were, before I use myself, not hypothetically as I have been here, but actually on my own experience, so perhaps you'll understand this a little better. But what I'm saying here is now, if I am invited as an unconverted person by the energy of my own spirit to exercise faith, and I don't have any such energy, I'm actually dead and anything that I do, I do as a spiritual corpse. The thoughts and intents of my heart are only evil continually. If the invitation is given that way, if I understand the invitation correctly, and if I respond on the terms the invitation is given, then my coming would be spurious, counterfeit, false, merely an act of the flesh. Now, I'm adding, you got, I hope you understand that, I am adding that I am not saying that as a matter of fact, as a matter of theory, yes, that as a matter of fact, every Arminian invitation is consciously of that sort or articulated specifically as such, most of all is understood by the person who receives the invitation. So that I say, it is utterly conceivable that though there has been a false invitation, a real and profound misunderstanding by the evangelist, the person who hears the invitation may be truly converted, almost in spite of the evangelist, and he comes not because of his own natural power, but because in the day of the Lord's power, by regeneration, he is made willing. Now, my own illustration is simply this. Here I was, apparently converted at about 18 years of age because an Arminian, mind you, told me the story of the gospel in the way in which I, for the first time in my life, understood it. I mentioned this, and then I embraced Christ, I thought, and had one question in my life, how will I serve him? Now, for two years, as I said before, I labored under the impression that the faith I had, I had generated. Now, I was right, I think, in one thing. I really did have faith. I was profoundly wrong in thinking I had generated the faith. 
Remember, it was Dr. Orr in that classroom, my second year in college, who, when he said regeneration precedes faith, who woke me up to the realities of the matter. I've explained that to you before. Then I realized what happened to me. I realized that that faith that I did exercise at 18 years of age and wrongly thought had proceeded from my natural power, as a matter of fact, had been exercised, but it had proceeded from my regenerated power through the Holy Spirit. You see what I'm saying? For two years, I was a raving Arminian myself. It was absolutely, con- before I even knew what the word meant, absolutely confident, not only of my faith in Christ, which is right, see, but of my faith in me, my faith that I had produced the faith, and yet I think it was genuine faith. You get my point? I was actually made over again through the presentation of the gospel by an Arminian who had the wrong conception of the way a person came to Christ. And had I followed him at that point, had I actually merely exercised my own natural power and thought I was a true believer, I would have been in a state of delusion for those two years. But I think actually I listened to the gospel he presented and fortunately didn't understand or believe or he didn't present this error which he would have had associated with it in his mind. So I was truly born again through the instrumentality of an Arminian witness to the truth because the truth which he gave was used by God and not the error which he either didn't give or I didn't understand. So much for number six. Number seven, almost all who sought found and almost all who did not seek never did find Christ. I put the almost but because in number eight, Sometimes seekers did not find and non-seekers did. God is sovereign. No seeker dared ever forget that. We mentioned the fact that in the Puritan circles when this evangelism was rife and the standard procedure and real biblical Christianity was being preached in its fullness, the whole counsel of God, there were seekers who after a long time actually began to question God, but there was another uh, problem also that bothered some seekers who had gotten weary in the process, and that was, here's John Gerstner again now, 20 years later after seeking and nothing happening to me, 40 years and nothing happens, and here's this guy who's been laughing at me for the last 40 years. You idiot. Oh, how in the world can you believe such n- claptrap as that? Missing out on all the fun. Uh, how silly can you get, Gerstner? And here I go on. That guy, full of O's, filth, indulging in every kind of iniquity possible, not missing a possibility of sinning to the uttermost and so on. And lo and behold, after 30 years of my seeking and nothing happening, he's converted. God, how can you do that? 30 years I've sought you. And he laughed at me for the whole 30 years. You let me go on perishing and you save him. That happened. And of course, I have to realize he, God, is sovereign. He saves whom he will, and he is under no obligation whatever to save me. Thirty years are 3,000 years if I live that long, and I wouldn't be owed anything by him. And this guy, if he lived 3,000 years of sinning, could be the moment before he died, saved from it all and gloriously translated to heaven. God allowed that to happen infrequently, but enough to drive it home that grace is 
sovereign. God saves whom he will. Number nine. And nine and ten sort of uh, show you something about the whole thing, especially as Edwards developed it. See if we can uh, get this. I don't think I'll have to make much comment on it, but it is a very interesting uh, passage and shows something about the way Edwards interprets the Bible as well as the way in which he pursued evangelism. And again, this is a kind of typical model of the Puritan procedure. There's nothing uh, distinguishingly Edwardsian about it. Number nine, in general, seekers were like the beggars outside the walls of Samaria when it was being besieged by the Assyrian army. They said, if we stay here, we'll surely die. If we go to the Assyrian army, we may be saved. You remember that the Assyrian army had fled and the beggars not only survived, but found a fortune. Now here's Edward's sermon on that passage. A possibility of being saved is much to be preferred to a certainty of perishing. That's not contradicting what we said before, that if a person didn't seek, he certainly would perish. But here, Edwards is rather literally following the, pa the pattern of the story. These beggars were outside the besieged city. They couldn't get anything to eat. And if they stayed there, they were certainly going to die of starvation. That was certain, you see, in that particular kind of case. That particular couple of non-seekers were in such a situation that if they didn't seek, they would certainly perish. They stayed where they were, and of course it would be true of any human being in a predicament like that. If he stayed where he was, one thing was sure, he would perish. Now they had one possibility. They couldn't get in the wall, but they could go to the Assyrian army, which was parked below, threatening the city. Now, being Jews, of course, they didn't have much hope going to the enemy army. They could easily have been slaughtered at sight. That was a risk they ran. But you see, the point was, there was no risk at all where they stood. They would certainly die. Now, they could die in that Syrian camp, but they just might be spared. There was a possibility that they would not die. There was a possibility, however remote, however uncertain, that they wouldn't be put to death. And since you have the choice between the absolute certainty of dying and the sheerest, merest possibility of not dying, of course, that's by far the more preferable. And so Edwards preaches this sermon. But you see how Edwards does the thing. He realizes this is a historical episode. Edwards isn't suggesting for a moment an allegorical interpretation exhausts the meaning of the passage, but he didn't hesitate to use allegory. And I think he felt that that historical episode, which served a significant piece of information for enlightening the reader about the historical situation of the time and so on, also had what the interpreters sometimes call the sensus plenior, a further meaning, a meaning even more than the historical episode conveyed, though there's no denial of that. And Edwards is virtually saying, he doesn't argue the point, that God the Spirit gave us this historical episode to teach us something far, far more important than the historical episode. Namely, that we all are like those lepers outside the walls of Samaria. We are perishing. We are as good as dead. If we stay where we are, there is no doubt about it. Now, obviously, even though you're not at all certain that you'll avoid that, you are absolutely certain there's a possibility of it. And the merest possibility should certainly be exploited. See, here's the rationality of the Puritans. They're keen thinkers. I could hear John Smith say, boy, that's astute. Boy, that's astute. Of course, that would be implied by this particular episode. 
Of course, any sinner thinking about its parallelism to his circumstances would realize, I am that beggar. I am in that situation. I am certainly going to die and perish forever if I do something, and I, don't, I haven't committed the unpardonable sin. I can't be sure God will never forgive me, and therefore, as long as I'm alive, there's a possibility of my being saved. I'm going to start seeking for salvation immediately. And while this episode doesn't guarantee me that I will actually find Jesus Christ and the fortune of everlasting salvation, nevertheless, the possibility is there. And as I say in this general context, the probability is there. The seeker for God in all likelihood will find these grand treasures. He will find Jesus Christ. No, don't think it's certain. Remember the man who never sought, who found. Remember the man who sought 40 years and perished. God is sovereign. Never, never, never forget that. Well, as I say, we're a little behind time. Let me just take the last minute or two here to read to you the next lecture, 42, Seeking Number 4, and I'll at least get the first proposition before you, and we'll take up the story on the next lecture. One, the reader of this section can see what a vast difference biblical seeking evangelism is from the four other forms commonly practiced today. I think if I took a poll of those who uh, see and hear these videotapes on handout theology, I can't imagine that more than 1% of them would have heard of this kind of evangelism or seen it. And on the other hand, they would know completely, even though they may never have had it analyzed publicly before, that these others are the standard forms of evangelism, if you call liberalism, or sort of non-evangelism, it's evangelism as the liberals understand it, which is non-evangelism in anybody else's opinion. And this idea of sacramental salvation and surrender evangelism, and when you come to think of it, the non-activity of the shruggers and so on is the usual thing. And this description of seeking which you, Gerstner, say is the biblical form, and the whole Puritan tradition said the same thing, and you, if you're inclined to agree and say that is true, then we really have a deplorable, deplorable evangelistic situation, and we must get up and about, not only believing the whole counsel of God, but seeing to it that when we present it to a lost world, we do it as God has told us to do it, and not the way we are generally mispracticing it today.